Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, participating in the fourth and last panel of Future of Tradition um, uh, virtual um, edition. Uh, my name is Georgiana Stancho. I'm the curator at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum, and I have here um, Desiree Roskopf, Nathan Etherington, and Gina Heinbockel, uh, who will be our panelists. So we will first uh, go through a short video. Uh, actually, it's three videos. And uh, after we watch the videos, we'll come back and we will do a little introduction by every panelist. And uh, then we'll continue with the questions that you have sent to us. So uh, let's go, Sarah, with the short video. Welcome to the National Air Force Museum of Canada. My name is Gina and I'm a museum educator. At the museum here, I'm in charge of the education department. Let's find out a little bit more about my job, shall we? Have you ever visited a museum where they had lots of fun activities for visitors? Or maybe your teacher took you on a trip to a museum where your class participated in activities that were not available to other visitors? If you did, you actually experienced the work of a museum educator. You probably did not give it much thought at the time, but a lot of work needs to be done before a class can come to visit. Your actual job will depend on the museum you're going to work at. Some museums have multiple people in their education department, others may only have one. And sometimes that person might also have another job, for example that of assistant curator. Here at the National Air Force Museum of Canada, I'm the only paid staff member of the education department, but I have a lot of volunteers and as a result I'm also the chief volunteer coordinator for the museum. So what does my work look like? Well, let's start by saying that no two days look alike. The most important part about my job is to create fun, educational and engaging programs. Now these programs, however, also have to fit with the Ontario curriculum if they're for schools. So for my grade 6 class, we talk about the theory of flight. While grade 1 students learn about the work of a search and rescue technician. High school students who come with their history class will compare aviation advances from the time of the Great War to the present. So I'm a very creative person and that comes in really handy for my job. Just look at the board game here that I created for one of my programs. It's about a prisoner of war escape um, from the Second World War called The Great Escape. Right. So program creation may be my favorite part of my job, but of course unfortunately it doesn't happen every day. Much of my day is actually spent in my office here. This is where I talk to educators, uh, communicate with them about programs, help them understand how they work, and uh, set up the, uh, the day for them. Yeah, so some teachers need uh, a specialized program, so flexibility is also key for my job. So when a program is actually booked, this is when I end up uh, working with my volunteers to schedule them, and uh, sometimes also I have to train them because they need to understand what the program is all about, and they may have never taught it before. On the day of the visit, I ensure all stations are set up and stocked with sufficient supplies before I then greet the group and explain the program. I also always have to be ready to jump in at a moment's notice if a facilitator has to cancel at the last minute. Imagine, in the fiscal year, from April 2018 to March 2019, I actually worked with 106 visiting groups with a total of 3,600 youth and I provided about 135 programs because some groups actually require more than one program at a time. Um, in addition to our school programs and cadets and other programs like camps, I also create programs for the public, for example for days like uh, family day or on PA days. If at this point you think this could be a job for you, you probably wonder what kind of education is involved. There are multiple paths to this job. Mine was possibly a little bit unconventional as I am a trained teacher and historian and then I took the uh, museum study certificate while I was actually already in the job. So this is me and my job in a nutshell. Thank you so much for your interest. Welcome to the Brand Historical Society, the 21st museum in the province of Ontario and the 51st museum in Canada. Originally located in the basement of the Carnegie Library downtown Brantford, the Brant Historical Society purchased 57 Charlotte Street in 1951. It opened to the public the following year 
before receiving an expansion as a Centennial Project in 1967. The permanent exhibits tell Bramford's story at the turn of the century when Bramford was third in gross domestic product in the country due to its industry. Temporary exhibits like Hats Off to You, our period bedroom exhibit currently displaying fashions from the early Victorian, and our new Hardy exhibit are regularly changed, so there's always a reason to visit. Programming work is the lifeblood of museums and can turn a one-time visitor into a regular visitor. As you have hopefully learned earlier today, exhibits and collections work are the fuel that drive programming content. So here at Myrtleville, we've been doing quite a number of things uh, during the shutdown. Uh, we started with our virtual summer camp, uh, which included doing crafts uh, like Pioneer Days theme, um, we had an uh, Ancient Civilizations theme, made things like kites, um, and then we also kind of ended the season with uh, some more intricate kind of crafts like dyeing uh, wool, which kind of led into our Culture Days. Uh, so during Culture Days, we uh, dyed some wool with natural materials. Uh, we made some preserves with things that would have been found on the farm during that time. Uh, we posted all those videos to our Facebook page. Uh, in the future, we're planning on doing a museum in the box for uh, our Christmas program. Uh, so that involves putting a artifacts in a box, uh, as well as uh, craft materials and things like that, dropping them off at the school with a video attachment so that they were, will be able to do the program that they would normally do here at the museum. They can do it in their own classrooms as well. Uh, so that's pretty much our, our plans for Myrtleville for our, uh, our 2020 year. Our adult programming includes walking tours that are run by our volunteer, Brian Moore. Each year, Brian puts together a list of walks he is prepared to offer, with one or two new walks offered each year. Brian also coordinates our speaker series from September until May. Topics for this year's speaker series include Buildings We Have Lost, Gypsum, The Rock Nobody Knows, and the First World War and the Enemy Experience in Brantford and Hamilton. During May as Museum Month, we provide daily programming. This year, we had to adapt our approach with online programming provided by our summer student, Tara, through the Young Canada Works program. Over the summer, our other summer student, Natalie, through the Canada Summer Jobs program, produced our own version of Drunk History called Brant History Happy Hour. Here's a clip from one of our favorite scenes. But, like any classic government story, Ottawa asks for more information and wants Coin to go to Brantford and figure all this stuff out. So, some time passes, Coin takes a while to get the info that Ottawa needs, but he eventually comes to Brantford being like, oh, sorry, I was in Muskoka, and goes and surveys with Mr. McFadden, another new president of the BHS, and Mr. Whale, who was a local artist and part of the Whale painting legacy. So, Coin's like, okay, I see what's going on here, let's do a cairn for this thing. But then they start fighting about where the Ford was again. McFadden's like, no, 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 it's near Ford View Court. But Whale's like, uh-uh, buddy, it's in the area of Kirby Island, north of the Lorne Bridge. Duh. If you are an outgoing and creative individual, perhaps a programming position is the right heritage career for you. Hi everyone, my name is Desiree and I am the Education Coordinator at the Visual Arts Centre of Clarington in Bowmanville. I did my YCW internship here in 2019 and was hired directly into my current role afterwards. I have an MA in History from Western University with a focus in Military History and Collective Memory and I'm currently taking my Certificate in Museum Studies through the Ontario Museum Association. I am responsible for camps, PA days, school and community programs, and I also work alongside professional art and pottery instructors to coordinate skills workshops and regular weekly adult and children's classes. 
These include hyperrealism, watercolor, beginner pottery, wheel throwing, and drawing and painting. Our programs have fine arts education at their base and an exhibition connection and an interdisciplinary element. Because we are a non-collecting public art gallery that shows living artists, there's always new program opportunities and inspiration. It's really important that we understand and communicate the artist's vision and their work when creating and executing a program. An open line of communication between curation and education is the best way to accomplish this. Flexibility is a crucial part of programming. A project will look very different from its initial conception to the final version, and sometimes you have to respond to unexpected circumstances like COVID-19. We had to figure out how to make summer camp virtual this year, which raised questions about accessibility, what was the best way to teach art online, what format should it be, Zoom or pre-recorded, etc. How could we best serve our community? The result was Creations from the Couch, which had a camp portal with downloadable pre-recorded videos, material kits, and a live Zoom session on Friday. We took this approach because through the live Zoom session, campers could still interact with each other and have that social component of camp that everyone really enjoys and still share their creations in a controlled environment. But by pre-recording the videos, we removed the need for parents to commit to a set time, have strong Wi-Fi connections, or to, for the campers to always have access to a computer. One of the eight weeks of camp was Art Explorers, which taught art history from prehistoric times to modern day. Campers were able to create their own art inspired by a particular movement or famous work, including realism, abstract, and pop art. This gave them an opportunity to interact with artworks that they've probably seen in school or in galleries and learn more about how even a simple piece of art can actually be very intricate when you begin to create it yourself. My favorite part of being a programmer is the constant collaboration between myself, colleagues, instructors, and class participants. Everyone brings their own experience, understanding, and perspective into the gallery, and it creates this unique platform to exchange ideas, build connections, and explore creativity. Thank you so much for listening. I'm looking forward to virtually meeting all. I'm sorry, I forgot I was muted. So thank you. Uh, now, after we have seen uh, the little video, I'm going to uh, ask our panelists to introduce themselves. And I will start uh, in the, the order I see them on my screen. So the first one on my screen is Nathan. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nathan Etherington and I'm the Programming Community Coordinator here at the Brent Historical Society. I started here first as a volunteer in 2014 and then uh, was hired in 2015 as a programmer and now I essentially do everything here. Thank you. Uh, the next one, one on my screen is Desiree. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, like I said, my name is Desiree and I'm the education coordinator at the Visual Arts Center of Clarington. So I was hired into my role right after my YCW internship there. And we are um, kind of a one person education department and we have interns that come in through uh, YCW. So I handle um, essentially all the programming and work with the artists, instructors and um, some budgeting and the fun paperwork stuff as well. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Gina. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Gina, as you heard in the video, and uh, I work at the National Air Force Museum of Canada. I was actually hired by Georgiana when she was well, uh, the Georgiana curator. Georgiana worked at National Air <laughs> That's right. Georgiana used to be the curator at our museum. Um, and that was uh, almost nine years ago coming this uh, spring. And as I mentioned in the video, I'm also a department of one, but I have a whole lot of wonderful volunteers and they help me a lot with uh, the programming. But essentially everything else from creating, from uh, contacting the teachers, discussing programs, all the way down to uh, sending them the invoices for the programs, that, that's essentially all on me. So thankfully I'm not sick much because there's hardly anybody who could <laughs> really just jump in. So that's me. Thank you. So uh, now we are going to move on through the questions. And um, I, well, I received the questions uh, in a certain sequence here, but I think we should uh, start with the last one on my list and you will understand why. What fields of study are required? 
obviously to do what you do in your positions. So uh, anyone who wants to jump in first? I mean, I, I can start out. Um, okay. And like I said in my introduction, I came to this job um, through a detour, really, because I'm a trained teacher, but I also did my teacher training in Germany. And the interesting thing is um, part of my training was history. And right from the get go, when I um, took all my classes, I had to pick something that was related to working with schools, so the practical aspect of teacher training. And uh, we had a class on museum education, and I thought that was so fascinating. But this was 20 somewhat years ago, and it wasn't really a thing back then. So it was something that always interested me. So when this job at the museum came open, it was almost like it was a calling. I said, yes, that's exactly what I always wanted to do. And uh, after, like I said, almost nine years, I'm still super happy to be there and um, creating programming and working with my volunteers and seeing the kids come in and have a fun day. Yes. Nathan? Yeah. So uh, I also came to the museum work through a kind of a haphazard path. Uh, I went and studied science at the University of Waterloo. I was doing earth science and geography, absolutely hated history. And then I also did my teacher uh, education certificate. And through that, we had to do a practicum that was uh, in a, a non-for-profit or something in the community. So then I went back and volunteered at my local museum in Paris, Ontario, and I started developing programming from them. And all of a sudden history came alive to me in a very different way, because the things that we talked about or the things that I was educating about were contextualized in, in the community. So these are things that I walk past every day. And because of that, I gained this kind of new appreciation for history. And then I employed a lot of those scientific concepts. So I did a geography aspect. So often when I'm thinking about storing and sorting information, I do it based on like place. And geography is described as, you know, people, people uh, and places and things, right? And then history is just time overlapped on top of that. And so I use that to kind of guide a lot of the principles that I use in what I do. Thank you. Desiree. Um, it's probably going to be a theme, but I also came to the museum field kind of in a haphazard way. Um, so I, I've always enjoyed history, had a great high school teacher who believed that history should not just be something that you memorize dates, but you should actually be able to interact with it. Um, so I had a very good first step in that. So I went to school actually with the intention of becoming a university history professor. Um, and I got my MA in history. And then halfway through my MA, I realized that the aspects of history I really liked, um, heavily teaching and making it kind of more interactive, I couldn't do in a university setting to the same extent that I wanted to. Um, and then actually, um, uh, through talking with uh, Sarah, I learned that um, in the museum field, there actually are ways that you can do education. So I went down that route and now I'm doing my certificate in museum studies while I'm in the field. So again, kind of a roundabout way yes. of coming. Indeed. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on with uh, the next question that is, what's your favorite part of the job? if you have any, or maybe you have more favorite parts. Uh, okay. do it. I'll start with this one. All right, Nathan, uh, please. So uh, the favorite part of my job is researching things and a lot of the collections work that I actually do, uh, like I mentioned in the video, um, a lot of the work that I do on the collection side of things actually turns into the fuel for my programming content of what I'm doing could be an exhibit, it could be an education program. Um, so the research part is the part that always speaks to me because you're looking for those stories. You know, there are certain stories that everyone's heard about Brantford before, like Alexander Grant Bell and the creation of the telephone, right? So now how do we put new spins on that story? So uh, we did that this summer and we highlighted uh, the first indigenous person to speak over uh, the telephone that was friends of the Bell family. 
And so we talked about that a little bit. That's very interesting. And Desiree. Um, so I already mentioned the collaboration aspect, but definitely um, in the same vein is the research and program development. I think my favorite part is getting to test out new programs, um, seeing how they work and um, how we can modify them. So the creation of new programs is probably my favorite part. And Gina. Yeah, there's clearly a theme going on here I, <laughs> because it's the same for me. I enjoy the creativity that I that comes naturally to me and to bring that into the, uh, the programming. Um, I showed you the, uh, the board game that I designed a few years ago. And uh, I've also, for example, done uh, an escape room. Similar, not, not that we lock anybody up into the, the museum itself. It's more like a scavenger hunt through the museum, um, but it has that escape room kind of feel where they have to come back to my classroom and they have to sort of open up a box to get to the next clue. And, uh, and I'm currently starting to work on a virtual one as well. So I, I really enjoy that part. It's not to say that I don't like to work with the kids and the, the schools, that is also very fulfilling, um, but that tends to come in a cluster. I know that's another question that's coming up and it gets very exhausting when you do it day after day after day because you have no time for anything else. So I enjoy the other half of the year, which is more my quiet time and I can get back into just me in my office doing the research and putting things together. Yeah, indeed. Uh, thank you. So let's move on to the uh, next question. That is, uh, what's the hardest part of your job? So uh, do we want to keep the same sequence or someone has a preference as to um, jumping in? All right, okay. Nathan. Oh, yeah, sure. Gina, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so I think the, for me, the hardest part is that uh, A, I have in the meantime, so many programs. When I started, there weren't that many. Um, and I need to find volunteers who are able and willing to teach all these different programs. And my grade six program happens frequently. I'd say that's probably about 70% of my program. So that's pretty standard and pretty easy because I have a lot of volunteers who've taught it. But some programs come up infrequently like grade three, for example, we're not a natural place for grade three. I think uh, a pioneer museum would be a more natural fit in the curriculum. So then it's, uh, it's a matter of, oh, how did this program work again? Because we haven't run it in a couple of years. So that's, that's the hard part. And then I have to find volunteers who remember how to do it. And generally, because I work with volunteers, it can be a, a tricky part to find even any volunteer who's willing to do it because I have no paid staff that I can just task and say, hey, today, you're teaching grade three X, yeah. right? So that's the hardest part in my job for sure. Yes. So uh, uh, Nathan, is there anything um, hard in your job? Uh, I, I would say every day is difficult to some degree. Uh, it depends on the battle of the day. Uh, so uh, my job is, is very complex. It deals with anything. It can deal from public research, to a program, to putting together an exhibit, to uh, you know my everyday collections work. Uh, right now, I'm trying to do a mass dig digitization project. So everything in the archives that's never been organized, uh, we want to digitize everything and make it accessible to the public so that when we're looking for things, we know exactly where everything is. Um, so um, dividing my times between doing that and grants and uh, anything else, something goes wrong with the facility, uh, you have to deal with it. Someone tried to break in during the summer, uh, so I had to come in on a Sunday and deal with that. So the complexity is the most challenging part. And like everyone else has pointed out, being adaptable and flexible is like something that's really required um, when you're working in any musical position. Absolutely. We have all been there, especially over the past eight months. And Desiree, what's the hardest part of your job? Um, I'd say the hardest part of the job is when you have to make the decision to cancel a program or end a program because of lack of registration or it's just not fitting with um, what we're doing anymore or a mandate. You do become or at least I become kind of attached to the programs and it's hard to know, it's hard to make that decision when to not run something um, because you know people will look forward to it, but it's just not responsible to run them. Um, I think especially with COVID, we've all had that for like different reasons of like 
choosing not to run things on site. So making those decisions is the hardest part of the job, I would say. Yes. Yes, and uh, unfortunately it does happen. I mean, uh, some programs are more popular than others. Uh, and we can now move on to uh, question number four, which is how did you get into this field? Did you always know you'd end up in this position? And before I invite you to answer, I am going to reiterate something I said uh, already in the other panels. Um, to find out for those who are in undergrad programs or even high school, it's a good idea to go and try volunteer uh, in your museum. You will uh, have a feeling of, uh, at the end of it, of course, you'll have a feeling of what you want to do if you want to, to stay in that field. And anyways, that, that was my contribution to this question. I am going to invite our panelists to answer. Gina, do you want to answer? Oh, sure. I, I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> uh, no, I tried to bring my other screen back to life because it's oh, okay. two screens going. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, sure, I can. I, like, like I already mentioned, I, I never really thought I would end up in this job because like I said, it, it wasn't really a, a job that was available at the time when I first came across museum education. It was infrequent that museums actually had that position. And I think that's also why um, now there's a lot of younger um, students who are interested in that field, whereas I'm already quite a bit older. I'm sort of nearing more the end of my career in that sense. Uh, no, I never really thought I would end up here. And like I said, it's a bit of a dream come true that I actually got what I wanted without knowing it, <laughs> at least not when I graduated. <laughs> Yes. And on that note, uh, uh, it's true. Some time of, I mean, uh, not many years ago, there was uh, no uh, position as such for a community museum or a smaller size museum uh, designated to an education programmer. Nowadays, you, you even have a master's degree in museum education. There are uh, Canadian universities that are uh, providing these programs. So, uh, Desiree. Yeah, I, I think I've alluded to how I, um, I didn't go into university with the idea of working in museums um, or in galleries, as is currently the case. Um, but it came later. And same thing, I didn't know that it was actually a job you could have. Um, I knew museums existed. I didn't know how they ran. Um, in high school or even um, in when I was doing my undergrad. So that was something I learned more about in my master's. Um, and then of course did the switch over and actually did my first, my first experience with education programming was at the RCR Museum. Um, and that was what sealed the deal for me of like, this is a job I wanna do because it was, it, it was something that just fit my, my interests. Um, so no, I didn't know that I was always gonna have this job, but I'm really happy to have it now. So I found my dream career without knowing it was gonna be my dream career. <laughs> yes, that's important. Nathan. Yeah, so when I uh, entered university, I, I thought I was gonna be a weatherman and uh, oh. little did I know that that was uh, really gonna change. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I look at things that I, uh, looking back now, I think that uh, history actually would have been a very uh, intuitive thing for me to go towards, but uh, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I happened along a different path, but uh, even though uh, I, use, I use those skills and I use them in a different manner, um, like many of the other panelists, right? I also did my uh, certificate in museum studies so you can go uh, the traditional approach in like going to uh, you know uh, college for a year to get a um, that certificate, and then going on and advancing and doing a master's if that's required. But um, you know there are other ways into the museum field. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, thank you, everyone. And now uh, we are, uh, it's a little bit a question, a little bit uh, in the same uh, category. Uh, and it 
sounds like this. Heritage and museum employers normally willing to take advantage of the services offered by employment agencies, either temporary help or permanent staffing. So uh, are we using employment agencies? Uh, not really, <laughs> at least not in my experience. I don't know if uh, someone else has uh, a different experience and please uh, feel free to join in. And uh, who wants to start? Yes, Nathan. Um, so I know like in, in that sense, we don't, uh, like we have in the past, there was uh, uh, a local agency that provided uh, short-term contracts with, uh, to people with disabilities. So we provided them some kind of learning opportunity where they could develop a new skill for a limited time period. Um, so there are things like that or Young Canada Works or Canada Summer Jobs. Those are um, employment programs offered by the government. And often when I uh, apply to these jobs, I'm uh, advocating for history people, but I'm also advocating for people from other disciplines because there's a lot of um, what I call transferable skills that you can learn in a museum setting at the beginning and you can apply outside in other sectors of the economy as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we use contracts at the VAC, but it's primarily um, our artists are contract workers. So they're already professional artists with their own practice. And then they will teach for us on a more independent contractor basis. Um, so we have that, um, but we, I don't believe we've ever used an employment agency, at least not to my knowledge. Um, again, we use YCW. Um, so honestly, just speaking from experience, if anyone is interested in getting into the field, you need to go for YCW. You need to get the summer um, experiences because that's going to be a really great way to get your foot into the field and learn some more practical skills. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't think we've ever used an employment agency in that sense. Um, I am going to add, I think, uh, you know, uh, larger scale museums, uh, for example, when they employ their CEO or uh, this kind of uh, senior management, for them, uh, the search and the finding the uh, candidates that qualify is a more complicated process and they probably use uh, employment agencies to staff uh, those positions. But uh, that's a, a different, uh, uh, not a different, it's the museums at a larger scale, like the ROM, uh, uh, National Gallery, these kind of things. Uh, all right, so I am receiving more and more questions here, and which is very good, but uh, we also have to make sure we have enough time to answer those questions. And uh, the next one, uh, well, the next one is uh, really interesting. How do you get a job in writing articles about history? <laughs> I have an answer to that, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will uh, allow uh, our panelists to answer first. Um, I can speak on the academic portion of it. Yes, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so article writing is really great um, to give some experience to your resume and to get your name out there. You don't often get paid for them. Uh, it's often done free. It's kind of just considered yeah. part of part of the field, or if it's something you're interested in. So you often don't get paid. I'm sorry. Yeah, they, you, you most likely don't get paid to to write articles. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that's uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what Nathan and Gina think. Uh, well, I, I asked a question um, at the staff table today about uh, possibilities of getting paid. And uh, one of the comments was made that maybe that's something like the Legion magazine, which of course for our museum has some bearing, that they might actually pay for articles. But I don't know for sure if that's the case or not. Um, like Desiree just said, I, I've submitted articles, but that was usually always more, hopefully they'll accept it. But never with the thought of getting paid for anything that you submitted for a scholarly publication. 
So yeah. sorry, can't help with that question. Yeah, the, the only uh, insight that I could offer really, uh, yeah, is, is along the same vein. I don't know that you can necessarily uh, make money off of this, but um, there, there is a lot of ways that you can get experience in doing things like that. So uh, you could, per, you could uh, research a, a small collection and provide um, some insight into that in your historical society's newsletter. Um, so that uh, helps you demonstrate taking, you know, uh, maybe a box of documents and condensing that into a story of, you know, 500 words or whatever the uh, text limit may be. Um, the other thing I want to say is that fits into my mass digitization strategy. Um, so that's one of the things that I want to do is have all these collections digitized and then I can go home for like six months and I have all the digital files and it's like having access to that entire collection. And I can pour through all the documents and come out six months with, you know, a 50 to 100 page publication. And that adds some revenue to the historical society for it to be able to do other things. Uh, yeah, the, the, the other um, aspect to this question is, uh, <sighs> Yes, you can, you can eventually get paid uh, for uh, writing articles about history, but um, that is very relative. Uh, you can, I mean, there is an academic uh, scholarly path that one has to take. It's, um, which is a, um, a very unique uh, kind of uh, career path. And then uh, you eventually end up writing books and maybe you make some money out of that, but uh, that is not the main uh, reason why you go in, in a profession like that. So uh, uh, th this is what we have to say. Uh, I am receiving more questions here. Just a sec. I don't want to get uh, mixed up. Okay. Any project that you have come up with COVID and you are particularly proud of? So in other words, uh, we were talking about flexibility before and I think uh, each and every one of us have adapted a lot. So uh, I am inviting you to elaborate on this topic. So. What's your favorite uh, COVID uh, programming project? Who's can start. Okay, I can start. Sure. Um, so when when COVID first started, as many of you may remember, there was something called Museum from Home that was sort of a hashtag that was trending, and uh, at our museum we tried that as well by putting uh, uh, activity sheets and things like that onto our website or onto our Facebook. And as part of that, I actually for the first time had uh, a chance to do creative writing. So I ended up writing a diary. Uh, to my knowledge, it's still on our website if anybody's interested. Um, it was in line with the idea of the, the last few months of the Second World War. So I wrote a diary from A, the perspective of a prisoner of war in my favorite prisoner of war camp, Starlock Luft Three, because we have an exhibit for that uh, camp. Um, and then his wife, who was in Toronto. So you see two diaries that are merged into one. So he writes what's going on at the camp. Uh, the camp eventually had to evacuate and these people had to force march through large parts of Germany in the cold. And she's sitting in Toronto and she sort of talks about her life in Toronto. And the interesting part was I've read about the prison of war camp for years. So I knew that story so intimately as almost like I was there. Whereas I had no idea what was going on in Toronto in the winter of 44, 45. So I actually had to do all the research for her story which because it was a civilian story seemed so much more natural and it was great fun. And yeah, so I, I ended up writing uh, my first piece of creative writing in the form of two diaries that are fictitious, but based on real history. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, so uh, early on in the pandemic as well, I was trying to think about ways of providing content I thought, how can museums demonstrate their usefulness to people when they're stuck at home and they don't have anything to do? So I had previously digitized, uh, uh, we have a fire collection here. So I had digitized the uh, fire records from 1911 to 1915. And I had previously uh, 
started to transcribe uh, the entirety of the ledger. So I had done one year. So the first step was then to take all of that, uh, see if there's a way that I can create images uh, of, the, of the ledger, attach those images into Google Map, and then have a transcription fully written there so that people could understand what uh, fires happened in Brantford in 1911, where they were geographically throughout the city, read through the original report if they could read handwriting, and if they couldn't, then they could read the transcription that I had transcribed. So uh, it was a neat interactive exhibit online. And I also have another volunteer currently working on the next year. And hopefully that will allow us to upload uh, Fires of Grant for 1912 to our website next, uh, shortly in the new year. It's very interesting. And there's a ramp. Um. First of all, Gina and Nathan, those both sound like, uh, those both sound amazing. I need to check both those out. Um, yeah. I think probably the virtual summer camps, that was the biggest accomplishment. It's something that came later. Um, we had to essentially figure out how to get eight weeks of physical summer camp. And if anyone's ever taught uh, art to children, you really need to get your hands in their projects with them. Um, to like have anything come out of it most times um, or like just to correct and to fix. So we had to figure out a way to get all of that online. Um, so the virtual summer camp was the fourth iteration that we planned. <laughs> um, and we had an eight person team, none of whom were hired for film experience because we chose this later. I had no idea how to video edit. Um, so it was just really cool because what we produced um, I think was honestly just the, the result of having a really great summer team and we learned a lot of new skills um, and we were able to get the summer camps out um, and then we did art kits so that people didn't have to hustle, like go around and try and find um, painting and stuff which was just not a thing during the summer um, so that would be I'd say my favorite program favorite thing that we did. So uh... I would like to add here at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum, uh, we probably have our different uh, preferred programs, but if anything, it was achieving new skills because we had with, uh, with the museum closed and as everyone said, uh, Nathan, uh, when you mentioned that uh, we had to um, show our usefulness, how, how relevant are we in a community that cannot go out of the house? So uh, the, we had to quickly retaliate and come up with solutions that would keep us going. And uh, in the process, we have acquired plenty of new skills, starting with um, video editing, video production. And um, I mean, the best example is this event that is uh, ongoing now. It, it, it has, it took uh, quite a bit of uh, skill learning in order to, uh, to have it uh, run. This is usually a on-site event uh, when we have uh, high school students coming to visit the museum, but uh, the, right now it's out of question and until uh, the museum reopens, we can't, uh, we can't ha have it. Um, I have uh, another question here. Is there any skill that you had to learn or have or have that you wouldn't have expected to need for programming? So uh, have you learned an unexpected skill? Video editing for me, that was a skill I never thought I would need. <laughs> Adobe, learning Adobe. <laughs> Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I think I might, I, I might say the same only because of this year, right? Um, yes. a, lot of the, a lot of the concepts that I knew came from my teacher education training. So things like uh, learning um, how to make education programs uh, that are tied to the curriculum documents because teachers look for that. That was something I was already well-versed in. But if you did, came through a traditional uh, museum career path, that is something that you perhaps wouldn't know how to do. Yes, 
indeed. So what do you say to this, Gina? Did you acquire a skill you never thought you would? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, maybe not so much during COVID. I mean, I, I can only uh, concur with the other two panelists. I wish in my case that I would have had the opportunity to learn about video editing and things like that, because I certainly lack that skill um, or like uh, any kind of graphic design software. Um, I did learn about Microsoft Publisher, which is, a, I mean, it's simple, but I, at least I, I learned about that. I, I think the biggest challenge for me uh, that I had to sort of learn is when you have so many different volunteers like I have, um, you have to get to know them all and you have to sort of be cognizant of their individual needs and abilities and, uh, and how you talk to them and what you can ask of whom. So that soft people skills that I had never had a need for in my previous jobs because I was teaching actually uh, um, where it was just me. I didn't have to adjust to these other people in that sense. So that was definitely a skill that I had to learn and I had to learn in a hurry and they, they still all are with me. So I think I'm doing well, but definitely something I had to learn. Yes. And uh, one more question. Uh, do you have a dream programming project that you would like to do? Uh, time and budget are not a limiting factor in this scenario. I'm laughing because yes, I do. Unfortunately, this is a program that or an idea that started after Georgiana already left the museum, but it goes back to my uh, prisoner of war story that I am so in love with. It sounds, love sounds like wrong in a way, but it's such a fascinating story. And I started years ago um, creating a database. It's really just a spreadsheet um, where I started to collect the names of every single Canadian airman that was at Starlock Luft 3 um, from 1942 to 1945. Um, in the meantime, I have over 600 names. And if I had the money and the experience and the IT support, I would want a, um, like a virtual touch base kind of uh, thing in the museum where people can click on it and they see everybody's story come up. And when we have visitors come to the museum and they would say, that was my great grandfather, um, that they could then send us pictures and we could embellish the story with real documents that, that we don't know at, about at the moment. So like, yes. a, like a living document, that, that's my dream. Unfortunately, I need to win the lottery first. So <laughs> keep hoping. Yes, yeah, the, the, I mean, um, obviously, it's, um, the, the question was if time and budget are not a limiting factor. <laughs> I, and I know that uh, time is uh, of, of the essence than money, of course. And uh, it is indeed extraordinary to be able to uh, set up programming that engages the community. I mean, that's why you do it, right? And uh, when you see uh, the community really engaged, even if it is just a comment on a Facebook post that you do, uh, it does uh, bring a um, feeling of satisfaction, I guess that's the term. Nathan. Uh, so uh, building off of an earlier thing that was mentioned, someone mentioned uh, programs that have failed and uh, that's one of my things that I'd like to have come back. I had uh, developed a GPS program, so students could use a GPS, go to some downtown historical landmark, and then they have a question that they would read there, and that would lead them to their next location and their next coordinates. So I tried to develop this. I spent uh, a whole bunch of time developing the resources, and when I went to uh, run the program, I had developed the costing for it and everything. The school didn't want to pay the money and they tried to come back at me and say, well, you need to do it for half the cost. And I said, I can't do it at half the cost. Um, I need to purchase the equipment and that's what this kind of goes towards. So um, uh, re relaunching that program would to me be something that I would like to have happen. Yeah. It does happen. So there's a ring. Uh, there's a few. Um, I guess the, on top of the programming wish list, if money and time were not an option, would be to be able to start offering um, some more digital art and digital design courses, actually having Macs and computers on site to teach this more modern version of art as opposed to just paper and pen, but like uh, more graphic design, um, 
urban design, things like that. Those would be really cool uh, courses to add. So if money wasn't an option, probably one of those would be on the top of the list. That, that's uh, great to hear. And now uh, uh, I have invited Sarah on the screen because we have uh, four more minutes and uh, maybe she wants to share some of her dream projects. Yes, so we all have dream projects. This is like the, the thing that we have. Um, by the way, Sarah Coates, public programmer here at the RCR Museum. Um, I have science programming I desperately want to do. Yes, Nathan is excited because it's exciting. I want to run chemistry and physics programs, but every time I carve out a bit of time to try and work on them, something else happens. So I do have a folder in the museum of chemistry related programming that someday, someday will get to be um, a thing because I think with history, people really get this idea of it's just history. Yes. And that's the curriculum you do. Whereas you can talk about so many different subjects using history. And I'd love to do, get into some of the, 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 the more science end of it because people in sciences don't always think that, that, oh yeah, we can talk about history and science in the same breath. And I think that would be um, an absolutely fabulous thing to do someday. But yeah, time, is, time has been the big one on that one. I just never have gotten caught up. <laughs> Unfortunately, but uh, to that uh, to that uh, respect, uh, I I would just like to um, highlight the uh, one important aspect. Uh, a, a museum is in generally about history, and there would be a history component. Uh, th this is this may be misleading. Uh, our uh, subject matter and uh, the activities, the programming that you can do, uh, is is not dependent on the subject matter. It can fit in the curriculum in a, a variety of ways. And in a military museum, you can teach physics and chemistry as Sarah would like to do. In an Air Force museum, you can teach, uh, I think, uh, uh, knitting if you want. I've always advocated this uh, uh, odd type of uh, interchange um, be, uh, between uh, subject matters. And um, yes, uh, did you um, have anything else to add? Yes, I did actually, because I, I was just thinking as we're going through this all, um, and a lot of us are in departments of one, but like, ha, um, this is just a question for people to think about, is the idea of how we work with the exhibit development. Like I know Nathan, you do a lot of it sort of all together as part of your job, but for the, for the rest of us, we sort of end up working with the exhibit to try and develop programming. Is there anything you find interesting about that sort of process of working between exhibit and programming. In other words, how do you relate with exhibit development uh, projects? Uh, maybe Nathan, you, you said you are alone at the uh, brand? Yeah, I, I essentially have uh, another person here that's a Laurier student and myself, and then we operate a second location at which our uh, education officer is at, and she deals okay. with all the children's education aspect of things. So, um, so it is a lot easier when you're a team of one to come up with those ideas or concepts. It's more, uh, for me, it's more like, I, I know I wanna do this exhibit. And then because I'm familiar with the curriculum and many different areas of it, I'm then able to divide and conquer and say, oh, okay, this, this is like grade four social science or grade 10 uh, history, you know? And I'll, I'll be able to find the program that will work for it. Desiree, do you have uh, something to add? Um, yeah, I think um, how I'm, I'm kind of very fortunate with my curator in that we tend to work very closely when it comes to when he's developing exhibitions. Um, he's developed, he develops them usually a year ahead of time um, and then passes on relevant information to me and we're able to brainstorm how education can come in um, and what programs to do for it. Um, so for example, um, he's, when he's doing an exhibition on futurism, um, I'm able to take that and create more of a community um, programming to like say, recreate pottery that represents them and then break it and bury it. Um, that's connected to a part of the exhibition that I'm, uh, that he can explain better than I can. Um, so just having that 
yeah, we we tend to work closely. Is what I'm saying. Uh, and uh, that that is a given. And uh, actually, part of exhibit development is uh, the the visitor experience, right? So uh, whoever is developing the exhibit would uh, rely or at least start a conversation with uh, people in in charge of programming. Uh, so. Um, Sarah, do you have anything else? Um, just sort of a question about, like, we've been talking a lot about um, programming going directly to, we're talking a lot about schools, but um, sort of how do you approach, for, like, there's also programming we obviously all do that is not school-based, um, to sort of give, a, like, a little bit of idea about that sort of different style of programming that's not curriculum or directly school-based. Uh, so uh, a lot of what I did, uh, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of children, that's not my preferred kind of client market, right? I like the adults and the adult programming kind of stuff. So it's a very different uh, skill set when you're, when you're dealing with adult programming. It's very diverse and somehow they're a lot more demanding. Uh, it can be like anything from someone mentioning one thing in the exhibit behind me and me having to be able to tell and relate the entire history to them. So um, a lot of the other elements of auto programming are uh, skill acquisition, like a knitting program or something like that. Um, there are also, uh, we also do walking tours, which are great. They're very active. They get people out walking around the community and realizing things about their community that they don't realize when they're driving past it. And then um, as well, when I started here, actually the, my, the main role of my job was to go into seniors' homes and provide uh, community programming. So each month I would have to develop a program uh, based on artifacts from the museum that I would bring into the retirement home and kind of tell them a little bit of a story. So give them a little bit of history about the object and what it is, and then bring it around to them and, and show it to them. You know, certain objects they can interact with, certainly. Uh, other objects are fragile. I don't like them to interact with them much, uh, but uh, that was that was the main focus of my job. So then um, everyone had to create a program every single month. So uh, things were constantly new and none of the old content had been saved. So uh, when I started, I started saving that content so that I didn't have to necessarily recreate something new entirely every month. I could, I could think about, oh, well, I can adapt this program into this, or this didn't work so well, but if I combine it with this, that's enough for a program. So um, there's lots of ways that you can do programming um, that's not just children's related programming. Yes. And uh, here comes the last question that we had for the day, and we actually are at the, the end of our uh, time. Uh, how does a graduate that doesn't fit uh, Young Canada work rules get a job? So uh, I guess the question uh, refers to the ability of a young uh, graduate. Uh, how do they get a job in the field, in this field? And uh, that th there are a variety of answers here, but I will uh, send you back to uh, a statement at the beginning of this uh, material, uh, volunteer in a museum. If you are interested to work in a, especially in programming, there will be always volunteer work uh, for delivering programs. Please, uh, the, our panelists, if you have uh, something to add, I just have one quick thing. Yes. Um, I know from, I, uh, I was on the board of the Ontario Museum Association. I just finished my term. So uh, in our museum statistics, it says that there are four volunteers for every one paid staff person. So uh, like volunteer work is an integral part of a museum. And that's how I got my job here is I started volunteering and it took me like a year, a year and a half to volunteer. But then through that process, people then got to know me, got to know the skills that I had and where uh, my uh, uh, best assets were. And then when the position became open, it was like Nathan, apply to this and you'll get it kind of thing. And, and so I applied and I was the only person. So I got a job.
Desiree and Gina, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I can only concur with that. And I think um, skill building through volunteering is unfortunately, I guess, the way to go when, uh, when there are no paid jobs at the moment, wherever that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so even for uh, older adults who graduated from a museum field, I, I'm getting the, uh, the specification here. Uh, I think the process is the same. Uh, more or less. Uh, that's uh, that's how uh, you get the hands-on experience, and then uh, no uh, start networking and this kind of things. Yeah, so, networking and working at, at as many different museums as you can, because yes, I people at a lot of different museums. So sometimes it will pop up on a resume, and I'd be like, oh, I know this person, and they can tell me about what they did at their museum they were a great person so yeah and like for example i have an education background in military history but i work in an art gallery so just constantly having different subject matter that you can become familiar with um especially if you're looking in education that's going to be very valuable because more and more we're getting um we're doing more interdisciplinary stuff so the more subject matter you're familiar with is better um but also like join the Emerging Museum Professionals Group. There are contract positions that come up and a lot of times it is easier from just what I've heard from friends to get two to three month um, or four month contract positions than it is to get full time. And again, they do lead into stuff um, in certain cases. So it's, yeah. yeah. And uh, for the emerging professionals, especially, it's applicable, uh, the flexibility as to the location, like uh, willingness to move around because you have to go with the job, right? Where the job is, uh, that may be important. And we are four minutes over our allotted time and I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to encumber our uh, panelists, whom I thank uh, warmly for uh, their enthusiasm and uh, for uh, uh, agreeing to participate, to contribute to this uh, module. Uh, so uh, we are going to uh, finish here. Thank you everyone who signed up and we can declare a Future of Tradition virtual edition uh, completed.